This wetland is home to one of the highest concentrations of saltwater crocs in the world. During the wet season, it's a fertile gathering ground for all manner of thirsty creatures. They mingle in rivers and billabongs, backwater creeks that swell with the rains. The ducks and geese play a numbers game, seeking safety in the crowd. But to the crocs, any individual would make a tasty meal. The salties wallow, showing only half-hearted interest in the squawking fowl. Feeling safe, the ducks focus on their own displays of dominance and bravado. Distracted, they fail to notice two crocs closing in. This meal is too small to share, but the victorious croc is not home free yet. A bigger beast has seen her kill. This is no ordinary croc. It's the Billabong King, a battle-tested five and a half meter male who dominates these waters. But in her place, the younger croc swims out of range. The Billabong King has stolen her prize. The King prepares to swallow his tasty morsel. But before he can eat, his young rival returns. It's a feeble challenge, quickly rebuffed. And then it's chow time. The croc opens a valve at the back of his throat. He keeps his head high to prevent water from flooding his lungs. Rocks he has swallowed will help him digest. As the dominant salty on this stretch of river, the Billabong King sits firmly atop the predatory food chain.
Less powerful crocs learn to keep a low profile when he's around. The king makes his home in the brackish waters of Australia's coastal floodplain. During the day, he can usually be found lounging on the riverbank. But others of his species venture further inland to the shores of freshwater streams or surf ocean waves many kilometers off the coast. Saltwater crocs range throughout the lowlands from India to the northern coast of Australia. They thrive during the wet season when water and food are easy to find. Rivers spread out across the floodplain, creating vast wetlands for the salties to roam. In a few months, the water will dry up, leaving baked earth and hard times. But for now, it's a land of plenty. Billabong King patrols his territory. He's keeping an eye out for males who might challenge him, and females he can woo. The wet season is also the season of love. Another male croc swims near, looking for a fight. During the mating season, male crocs travel great distances looking for females. The Billabong King has detected one at the edge of his territory. She is one of many he will mate with over the next few months. Mating happens in the water. Blowing bubbles gets them in the mood. When the time is right, the female raises her snout in submission. The king quickly approaches. In the murky water, tails intertwine, and his genitals, normally hidden inside his body, come out for the occasion. The two may mate several times over the next few days. In other seasons, he would never let her get this close. But tonight, their interactions appear almost tender. Not long after the Billabong King leaves, the female must start thinking about a nest. About six weeks after mating, she's ready to lay. An infrared camera reveals her labors in the pitch black night. She starts by opening up the nest she has so painstakingly constructed. Short bursts of digging are punctuated by frequent rests.
She's a big crocodile and can lay up to 80 eggs. Some have been fertilized by the Billabong King, but other males have mated with her as well. Once the eggs are laid, she piles vegetation back on top. It'll protect the nest and keep the eggs warm. The optimal temperature for their development is between 30 and 34 degrees. For the next three months, she'll stay close to the nest. Even food will become an afterthought. She'll only eat if a meal happens by. Despite her protection, the eggs may not survive. More than a third of all clutches get destroyed by floods, heat, or predators. Goannas are the worst natural offenders. But today, it's a more nimble creature on the attack. A dingo has come looking for some tasty fast food. The canine digs in, pawing at the mother croc's careful construction. He's eager to get at the protein-rich treats buried inside. The mother croc swims in to rescue her eggs. Lumbering up the bank, she chases the dingo off before he can do too much damage. She's not agile on land, but her teeth are ferocious enough to drive him away. He only got a few eggs, and she'll quickly repair the nest to protect those he left. The mother croc's vigil continues 24 hours a day. Salties, like most crocodiles, are primarily nocturnal. Her keen senses and lightning-quick jaws give her many tools for hunting at night. Aided by crystals in her eyes that amplify ambient light from the stars and moon, she sees exceptionally well. Her eyes shine hauntingly in the artificial beam of a flashlight. She spends most of her night on the river, keeping an eye out for threats to her babies and prey. Any creature out in the dark would be wise to give her a wide berth. Thirsty wallabies take advantage of their languor. The crocs specialize in lightning quick strikes from the water. But they're not great hunters on land where their prey can see them coming. The wallabies seem to know the croc's limits. They get close, but stay just out of range. It's a safe strategy on land. In the water, the Billabong King is out looking for a meal.
He watches as the wallabies slowly make their way to the water's edge. They opt for puddles away from the river. Or search for spots that seem too shallow for a croc to lurk. But they don't all get it right. The king sights his prey from a distance, then begins his stealth attack. He approaches with scarcely a ripple. strike speed of more than 12 meters per second, he gives his victim no time to react. Violent thrashing does more than just kill. It breaks the wallaby's body into bite-sized chunks that the crocodile can swallow. Every mouthful is important because he'll eat little in the cooler months ahead. As the Billabong King fattens himself up in the river, his offspring are getting ready to hatch. After almost three months in their hard-packed nest, the baby crocs begin breaking out of their shells. Temperature variations in the nest have determined whether they will be females or males. Cooler eggs produce females. The warmest ones hatch stronger, faster growing males. It's evolution's way of making males out of the individuals with the best chance of growing big. Big males have a higher probability of mating than smaller ones. But even small females will generally find a mate. Remarkably, nature has found a way to select for size and strength in the males, even before they are born. The babies start calling for their mother while they're still in their shells. They'll need her help to get out of the nest which is hardened into a rigid, cement-like fortress. She begins her parenting by digging her babies free. But the job gets harder from there. Using her mouth, pointy teeth and all, she must ferry them from the nest site to a safe spot in the water. The hatchlings are not easily corralled. Prudently, their instincts lead them away from other animals' jaws.
but once she gets a few into the safety of their watery nursery, the others hear their calls and follow them down. In the water, the hatchlings will primarily fend for themselves. Their mother will try to watch over them for several more weeks, but they'll still be easy targets for birds, turtles, fish, and even other crocodiles. If they survive to adulthood, they'll rise to the top of the food chain, but for the time being, they're close to the bottom. Only 1% will make it to maturity. It's now May in Australia, the beginning of the dry season. The weather has gotten cooler, and the crocs are becoming less active. Cold-blooded, they rely on the sun, shade, and water to keep them around 32 degrees. They warm themselves using a network of blood vessels and the scales on their backs. As the sun hits the scales, it heats their blood. It's an effective system, but slow. A croc as big as the Billabong King has to worry about his head overheating as his body slowly warms. Some scientists believe crocs open their mouths to cool their brains, using evaporation to draw away heat. Or, they could just be showing off their teeth, warning other crocs to keep out of their way. With no rain in more than a month, the massive floodplains, rivers, and swamps are starting to drain. Water levels drop, and crocs must relocate. The Billabong King retreats to his dry season haunts. With close to 50 years of experience, he knows which waterways stay wet all year round and will vigorously defend them. Smaller crocs are pushed into more hostile environments. Australia's dry season is a dangerous time for baby crocs. On a muddy riverbank, the three-month-old hatchlings are lucky to still have water. Their mother has chosen their nursery well. She remains nearby and will come at a distress call. But for the most part, she leaves her offspring alone. The hatchlings rarely venture onto land where they can easily be picked off by predators. But the need for food breeds bravery, and they do make incursions ashore in search of crabs, insects, and other small creatures. A black-necked stork has a similar diet, with one added delicacy, the young crocs themselves. Mudskippers on the riverbank look like easy prey. These amphibious fish walk on their fins. The hungry hatchlings find them impossible to resist, but difficult to catch.
Chasing prey around the bank is not how adult crocs hunt, but it works for the little ones because their prey is so small. Just like the adults, baby crocs are adaptable hunters, tailoring their strategy to their quarry. Today, there's an opportunity for crab. The little hunter returns to the safety of the water to savor his prize. Unfortunately for his siblings, he's not the only one out hunting. Despite their mother's close proximity, most of the hatchlings will share a similar fate. They're vulnerable on the surface. But then again, so are those who would hunt them. This is a welcome catch for the mother croc and will probably be her last for a while. As the weather gets cooler, big salties stop eating. They can't warm up their stomachs enough to digest. They can live without food for months, but as the water disappears from the floodplain, Many crocs will face an even more severe test of their metal. The last muddy pools become crowded oases. At this time of year, salties aren't concerned with defending their territory there is little to fight over. All they want is a spot in the mud. They need the water to help them keep cool. But as the pools dry and the crocs crowd closer and closer together, tensions do rise. One croc forsakes the dubious safety of the mud pit in search of a more inviting locale. He sets off during the cool of evening, hoping to find another pool before dawn. In the morning light, his tracks reveal good progress up a muddy riverbed. But he didn't get far.
With no water in sight and no protection from the sun, he won't last long. His organs bake as he sinks into the mud. The long dry season is taking its toll. And the summer rains are still months away. The last inland water holes attract all who can get to them. But even these pools are starting to turn deadly. Fish die off as the oxygen is depleted. The Billabong King is much better off. He's picked his winter residence with care and is sitting pretty in plenty of water. His half century of experience is serving him well. He knows just how to survive the harsh dry season and keeps the cooling waters all to himself. He also knows his secret only a few other crocs know. A secret that will get them on the move. For the informed few, it will provide some welcome relief from the hardships of the last few months. What sparks them to go is a mystery. But all at one time, they head for one specific spot on one specific river. Crocs have been known to travel more than 100 kilometers to get where they're going. The Billabong King makes his journey with his usual languid grace. Others have to cross dry ground on their trip. But they seem to know their way and take care to avoid overheating. They rest often and wait out the hottest parts of the day in the shade. One by one, the salties arrive at the site. Gathering near a small man-made dam, their numbers grow as the day goes on. By the time the Billabong King swims in, the banks of the river are covered with crocs. This special group is about to reap the rewards of their knowledge. In the dry season, as the river dries up, the dam separates the fresh water upstream from the salty ocean water below. But it also traps fish, mullet, which swam upstream to spawn during the wet season when the river was high and the dam was submerged. Unable to get back to the ocean once the water level dropped, they gather by the hundreds just above the barrier. But tonight, a super high tide will set the fish free. It's the king tide, which happens only twice a year. It's why the crocodiles have come. As the rising tide rushes over the dam, the mullet fight against it to get back to the ocean. The crocs are waiting for them.
Like bears stalking salmon, the salties hunt with minimal effort. They wait with their spring-loaded jaws agape, ready to snap shut at the touch of a fish. The crocs compete for the best spots in the river. And as usual, the Billabong King lays down the law. But there's plenty of fish to go around, and the crocs enjoy a hearty indulgence after a long season of want. From their tracking of the tide to their unusual fishing tactics, the crocs mullet hunt is a surprising display of intelligence for creatures generally thought to be driven by primitive instincts alone. Stuffed, the Billabong King waddles off into the night. He has fared better than most during the difficult dry season and seems well poised for another year of domination. January. The rains finally return, bringing much needed relief to the parched earth. Rivers and lakes fill up, and the plains flood once again. The Billabong King has made it through another year. If his size is any indication, he's probably pushing 50. But despite his decades of success, he's only as powerful as his latest conquest. He doesn't go looking for a fight, but is more than willing to engage if he feels his dominance is threatened. Today, Another salty is fishing in his space. It seems like a minor infraction, but the intrusion raises his ire. The Billabong King will flex his muscles. The rival croc is careful not to flaunt his fishing success. He takes his meal quickly when the king's head is turned. Even so, he gets put in his place. As he has done countless times before, the Billabong King establishes his supremacy without much of a fight. The hatchlings, his legacy, have a ways to go. They're almost a year old, with a lot of growing still to do. For the next four years, their greatest impediment to survival will be cannibalism by bigger crocs. Even their own father would eat them if he got the chance. But today, he has another delicacy in mind. With his keen eyesight, smell, and hearing, the Billabong King is drawn to a flurry of activity in the trees above the river. These are flying foxes which often roost near the water after a night of foraging for blossoms and nectar. The nomadic bats travel hundreds of kilometers and their colonies can number in the millions.
Perched high above the water, this bat would seem perfectly safe. But this croc has one more unique talent. Wielding his mighty tail with tremendous force, the Billabong King propels his body two and a half meters in the The bat has no chance. It's a stunning display of agility for the 1,000 kilogram croc. Just one more example of his adaptability and strength. A testament to his longevity and success. Year to year, he rises to every challenge, adapts to his environment, and cements his reign. 100 million years of evolution has created a creature who is master of his domain. A fine-tuned survivor of the harsh Australian floodplain. <laughs>